early how to use the marketplace to add to the giving of private and corporate foundations, the government, and viewers like me. <clears throat> Dave and Britt joined CTW in 1971 as assistant director of a project that explored the feasibility of a service-oriented urban cable television network. That was early for that. Ten years. See? In 1974, he was named vice president of corporate development, and in 1990, he took over as president and CEO. He began his career with the Northern Trust Company in Chicago and subsequently held positions with the U.S. government, including chief of legislative presentation staff at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. He received a B.A. from Wesleyan in Connecticut and a Master's of Public Administration degree from Harvard. Many television executives think of the kids' TV world as a kind of jumping off place to better jobs in the real world of adult TV. But a visit to David's office overlooking Lincoln Center, it's the ideal place for a theater not like me to have an office for, in New York City uh, with Cookie Monsters and Kermits and their friends perched all over the tables and chairs in the office. You can tell that David is very happy in his neighborhood. And why not? I mean, Sesame Street has won more than 100 awards, including 67 Emmys, two Peabody Awards, four Parents' Choice Awards, the Pre Jeunesse International, a Clio, and even an Action for Children's Television Special Achievement Award, to name just a few. Internationally, more than 100 million children have watched Sesame Street, and the show has been seen in 140 countries. Most interesting of all are the 17 international co-productions of this program. I wish I had all the names that, that the big bird-like character has in, in all those different places. Isn't he a porcupine in Israel? Yes. Um, especially the latest example, which is the Israeli-Palestinian version, where the coming together of that region's children seem to provide hope for the future that the newspapers may not be giving us right this minute. If you need proof about whether, uh, whether Sesame Street's lessons stick, you should have been at a recent forum at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where the show's producer and a writer, a music man, and Elmo celebrated the program's 30th birthday. This was just a couple of weeks ago. The audience of students and professors sang along with every song. They knew all the words. And when uh, they almost came to blows when it came time to pick up a beanie-type character at the end of the show. As you can see, I got the count, which is a, a highly prized specimen, right? But, but after all, I was Peggy Charon, so I walked off with it. There's, there's no question that television educates. It is because violent, stereotyped, over-commercialized programming educates that so many people worry about it. When we talk about TV's power to educate, we usually mean the ability to give us what we need to know to grow up healthy and wise in a democratic society. As Aristotle pointed out, I mean, after all, this is Harvard, I had to quote somebody who, with, <laughs> with some power. No one will doubt the lawgiver should pay attention to the education of the young, for the neglect of education ruins the constitution of the country. It makes sense to start with preschoolers, as this administration's commitment to ready-to-learn projects uh, in, in early childhood demonstrates. And, and that's a, a nifty commitment that comes out of the Clinton administration now. CTW expanded as David's responsibilities grew, with Sesame Street growing into a community with more focus on affective learning, dealing with a new baby in the family, the death of Mr. Hooper. Any of you? Uh, old or young enough to remember how they dealt with that. That won a big award, and it was, you know, I got chills thinking of, about the program. It was just terrific. And with disabilities and with respect for differences, I saw a show not too long ago that had Elmo, you know, Elmo, uh, sort of orangey red Elmo, and Whoopi Goldberg having a very serious conversation on a fence. They were sitting on the fence. And, um, and they were comparing skin and, and texture of, of the, their texture. And, and Whoopi just loved um, Elmo's feathery surface and his wonderful color. And Elmo felt the same way about Whoopi and her, her inter interesting hairdo and, um, and her warm brown skin. By the time the piece ended, they were all, they decided then instead of switching, they were happy in their own skin, but it was a beautiful thing on prejudice and all the kinds of things we want young children to know. 
Um, anyway, the, um, they also expanded into other shows for older audiences uh, of children, that is, you know, Electric Company, a Three to One Contact, Square One. Square One was a, a, a mathematics type program. And uh, it did a song about infinity. And it started with the, the screen filled with a picture, and then the screen got cut in half, and it was two. This is in the days before computers, right? And because computers do that kind of thing easily now. But then they divided into four and 16 and 32. And pretty soon they were just the same picture and a bunch of postage stamp sizes. And, you know, and infinity started to make sense to me. Um, in, in, in addition to Square One, there was Ghostwriter and Big Bag, which was produced for a commercial network, the Cartoon Network. Well, in the world of telecommunications with convergence and media merges, the electronic neighborhood is very different from the street where Sesame Street was born. Competition from new technologies and inadequate funding for public broadcasting requires new strategies for nonprofits if they're to survive. The multiplex possibilities of digital television will provide new platforms for education, but only if there's enough money to pay for programming and outreach materials. David's in a position to take advantage of these new media opportunities, and I look forward to his remarks on nonprofits in a new century. Thank you, Peggy. I do have to make one correction. Uh, it is true that, that Peggy closed down Action for Children's Television. It is not true that she retired. Um, and I can tell you, having been on the wrong end of a phone conversation every time we make a mistake, uh, that she's still very much in the game. Um, and I think we'll continue to be in the game, and we've been doing some, some interesting things together as we try to continue to fight the war of making television and media better for kids. Um, the nonprofit sector in the United States includes, by some measures, a million and a half institutions, it provides 15% of GNP, and it includes millions and millions of full-time staff, volunteers, donors, and service recipients. And these data, I think, are very, very impressive and important. Unfortunately, they completely miss what I think is most important about the sector, and that is its energy, its life, and its vital contributions to our society. De Tocqueville may have missed the subsidy to the Postal Service, as I read this morning, uh, on the way up. But I think he got right uh, the excitement and the energy and the satisfaction that comes from being part of this world. Consider the variety alone, from AARP, to which all of us in our time become members, whether we like it or not, and want to admit it or not, to the local church or synagogue that is, in fact, a little micro-conglomerate of community service providers doing daycare, doing job counseling, doing life counseling, feeding the hungry, uh, and occasionally worshiping in, in some of the more affluent churches, even bowling together, as you learned this morning. If you want focus, this last week I read in the New York Times, no less, about a new organization, a new nonprofit organization called the Society of Betty, which is uh, organized in, in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, around the name Betty, which is not used anymore. And in fact, they have merged with the Betty Association of Red Bank, Nebraska, translocal, this is now, uh, <laughs> singing the praises of a plain old-fashioned name. That is kind of the spirit of, of volunteerism and nonprofit in this country. Or to be serious for a minute, consider what nonprofits accomplish. In this room, in Peggy Chairman, Charon, is the epitome of advocacy in a democracy. Action for Children's Television, which she started virtually alone, took on two of the biggest and most powerful industries in this country, the advertising industry and the broadcasting industry. It took her about, what, four and a half years to knock off the advertising industry in terms of what they were doing to children. The broadcasters took her a little longer, a few more years, maybe even a decade or two, but um, persistence, Patient, well, I shouldn't say patience. You've never been patient about it. <laughs> I would say persistence and unrelenting uh, energy and attention on the part of the folks that Peggy was able to mobilize, on the part of the political process, on the part of 
the people within the industry who wanted to do better things finally made come to pass legislation which in fact has it resulted finally after some more work in ratings for kids television and for all television about kids and in three hours of educational programming being mandated by the broadcast networks over literally their dead body. That's work going back to the two organizations that started almost together for which Peggy two years ago, I think it was, got from the President of the United States the Medal of Freedom along with Joan Cooney who is the founder of my organization. Public television brings us programming that the commercial networks gave up on from opera to drama to serious documentaries. Uh, we at CTW, before I got there, started what pro programming for preschoolers on a scale that was absolutely unthinkable to anybody in the commercial world. They wouldn't have dreamed of doing it. Now, because of the success of both public television and Sesame Street and CTW, we are in fact surrounded by commercial efforts who are following the trail that we blazed and are doing very well at it. I'm sometimes happy and sometimes sorry to say. Um, these histories and millions of others, whether failure or indeed success, I think give meaning to the vitality and the needs served by the nonprofit sector. Like government and private enterprise, the sector touches virtually everyone and does so in a wide variety of ways. So as we come to a new century, I think there are great opportunities and needs for a vital nonprofit sector, opportunities to render service to society and for us to thrive. Along with these opportunities come some formidable challenges, as they always do. And today I'd like to focus on the challenges to success, the ones that emanate not from the outside or from the politics or uh, the forces that, that work in the society, but rather the challenges that come within the culture that we as nonprofits have built for ourselves, the cultural cha challenges of the world that we lived in, or live in, I should say. First, let me briefly define the elements of the opportunity that I think is ahead of us. It has two dimensions. One is the growing awareness and perception that government activity is of limited effectiveness in meeting many of the social problems of our culture overall, and in local communities in particular. The loss of confidence in government that, for example, that Dean Nye and his colleagues describe in why people don't trust government translates to an increasing aversion, at least in this short period of time, to government activities as the preferred solution to issues and problems of society. My own view, for what it's worth, is that the ongoing federally directed devolution of activities to the state and local issues, city, uh, local governments, uh, of issues and problems such as welfare will, when the dust clears, in fact likely result in an acceleration, not a slowing, of that national feeling that government doesn't have all of the answers, particularly at the local community level. And I don't say that just because I spent last Tuesday at my local state Department of Motor Vehicles trying vainly to get a license renewed. I say it because of a broader uh, set of reasons, but that's part of it. Second, the limitations of private enterprise and market approaches to social and related issues are also coming more clearly into focus. For all its power and vitality and current public esteem, the market does have real limitations on how well it contributes to improving the fabric of our communities and our society. Think for a moment of that nice television couple, Harry and Louise. You remember they saved us from the dead hand of government bureaucracy and health care instead gave us the dead hand of HMO bureaucracy in healthcare. <laughs> Certainly there are individual for-profit companies that may do well or provide a better array of services than individual nonprofits in any given sector of the economy. But the assertion that private enterprise, has been, as it has been so frequently said, can magi magically use the market to fix it, whatever the problem or issue, really isn't any more persuasive than the assertion that government action can fix it. And as private enterprise drives toward more and more consolidation and centralization, it's not very hard to predict that it too will be seen even less as the automatic best or even adequate answer to dealing with issues that society wants and needs to solve. These twin limitations then, the limitations of government and of private enterprise, or just as important, the growing perception of these limitations define a growing 
role for nonprofits in this country in the next century. There is just lots and lots of room between the role of government and the role of private enterprise, and that traditionally is the work that we have done in this sector. As I said earlier, with great opportunity comes great challenge. And today I want to provoke you a little bit by focusing on some of the challenges to success of nonprofits in the next century that are generated from within the culture of the nonprofit world itself. How we get in our own way and how unintentionally we encourage the broader society to have a view of us as ineffectual. We were talking about this just before we started, as ineffectual or feckless or romantic or wrong-headed and ineffective. What I want to share is obviously completely idios idiosyncratic and oversimplified because it's a point of view that comes out of my own little corner of the nonprofit woods and because it doesn't reflect any work at all at trying to make a comprehensive survey of the field. So let me not use George Carlin's four dirty words that you can't say on television or seven and instead talk about four broad cultural issues in the nonprofit world that I think we need to deal with and fix if we're going to be as successful in the, in the next century as we need to be. First is competitiveness and commercialism, two dread words in our sector. Second is economic success and the implications of that, which we don't like to talk about too much in the nonprofit sector. Third is accountability. And fourth is a better definition of what this sector should be called and what we should think of ourselves as. Let me talk about competitiveness first. Culturally, the word itself tends to make us nonprofit types somewhat uncomfortable. Yet I believe a strong and explicit sense of, sense of competitiveness is essential to our own success in the future, both as individual organizations and also as a sector. For example, when Joan Cooney and her colleagues began Sesame Street 30 years ago, their goal was to use the television medium to attract and teach young children. They understood that television viewing in the home is a voluntary activity and that they had to induce families to turn the dial away from predominantly adult entertainment and onto Sesame Street. They knew they had to compete for audience and they succeeded brilliantly. Some 25 years later, we as CTW had to confront the reality that others were taking viewers from us. Most of them entertainment, many of them adult entertainment producers, some of them, in fact, even offering programs of educational value for kids. But I found that inside CTW, emphasizing the need for us to be more competitive, encountered and, in fact, still encounters genuine heartfelt concern that competitiveness simply means giving up on the mission, selling out, going commercial. You, you name them the way it can be called. One said to me, I don't work at CTW because I don't want to have to worry about audience ratings. We're not here to be number one. Well, I think that's just wrong in terms of what our mission is. We can't teach a single child unless we can get him or her to view. And we need to be as competitive as we can be to get the audience uh, to, to look at what we do and to use the, the materials that we produce, whether on television or elsewhere. And the fact is that nonprofits are and always have been in competition in competition among themselves for resources from funders, for the attention of audiences or groups to be served, and in the delivery of services. But the tradition and culture of non-competitiveness is deeply seated as something that we just don't like to talk about. And I think that that is, in fact, the delusion that we have to get over if we're going to be successful in the next century. The second area of cultural challenge for nonprofits, I think, lies in the explicit pursuit of economic success. Among educational institutions such as this one, it's okay, in fact, it's probably mandatory to seek bragging rights for the biggest endowment, whether it's within the Harvard family or in comparison to other universities. But for those of us in much of the rest of the nonprofit sector, we're a little bit embarrassed about economic success. We tend to prefer to talk about how much greater the need is than our resource base, or we tend to talk about how inadequate our economic strength is to whatever the task that we have set for ourselves. In candor, as Christine Letts and her colleagues have pointed out, 
foundations with their aversion to operating support and their preference for new projects over proven ones and for their kind of neglect, really, of the institutional health of nonprofits have helped us take our eye off the institutional building challenge and the essential importance of economic success to achieving mission success for the long term. We each owe it to our own missions to make long-term economic independence a key goal. We have to recognize that in pursuing that economic independence, we have to stick with our values and with our standards, and we have to recognize that that is a very tricky business. In fact, most of us who are in the business of paying a lot of our own way really do live on the slippery slope, and we try to have to keep our toes engaged so that we don't slide down into just being a business and instead keep ourselves focused on our mission as well. But we can't do anything tomorrow unless we're economically strong tomorrow. And that has to be, I think, a key goal for all of us. Our roots in vows of poverty and in deficit generate ambivalence in another important economic dimension, and that is compensation. Culturally, nonprofits like ours get very nervous about big salaries and very defensive when we are attacked, and we frequently are. This issue will get tougher in the next century because I think there is strong interest on the part of students all over this country and even across the river, at those, where those folks go to school in the red brick buildings over there, in spending one or two of their six careers in the nonprofit arena. They probably won't become nonprofit lifers like some of us, but they may forgo stock options, equity participations, and whatever else those things are for some years along the way to gain the benefit and the satisfaction and experience of working in a nonprofit agency doing the kinds of things that we do. But we will miss a lot of the smartest and the best and the benefits that they can bring to our organizations if we won't pay them competitive cash compensation to the best of our ability. In the work that we do at CTW, our board decided early on that we must hire the very best television talent, the very best publishing talent, the very best talent in whatever field that we were working in, because children, no less than primetime entertainment, deserve the best talent that we can find. We're consistently criticized for it, and we've just as consistently upheld our belief in the principle. And I have to say that upholding the principle can sometimes be uncomfortable, and it doesn't always play out the way you expect it to. At one point, when the fight about public television was particularly heated three or four years ago, my compensation was rather widely published. And in fact, my compensation is outrageously high by traditional nonprofit standards. I cringed. I was embarrassed. I felt guilty. I did cash the checks, however. Um, <laughs> So when I saw an acquaintance in the media industry, I was one who had long since immigrated to Los Angeles, I wasn't particularly surprised when he mentioned that he'd seen my compensation in the paper. I was a little bit surprised when he looked at me and said with some sympathy, I knew you'd never get anywhere in public television. <laughs> the, the difference in the way we look at the world and the way they look at the world is, is very real. We have to, I think, face up to the fact that if we're going to get good people, we have to pay the best wages that we can pay. And, and be willing to take the heat for that. Let me speak briefly about the third area of cultural challenge, one that's less clear cut, I think, and, but it is accountability. Because I think many of us as nonprofits think that our being here and doing this work is sufficient accountability for anybody. We're giving, we're sacrificing, we're giving up other opportunities, and so don't bother us. I don't think that's going to work very much longer. We have to be, I think, accountable to our constituencies, to acknowledge and accept and make use of the reality that we exist to serve those constituencies and not the other way around. One lesson we need to learn from smart businesses is to listen and hear our audiences and build product and deliver services on that basis, whether audience is millions of kids and their families or a handful of neighborhood homeless, market-driven, doesn't necessarily equate to pandering. It can, but it doesn't necessarily. A second dimension of accountability is to systematically devote resources to evaluating the quality and the impact of our work. It's not just the thought or good intentions or individual sacrifices we make that count. 
Business sometimes can, with some reason, fairly say that the market provides an adequate evaluation of their work. People won't buy if it isn't good. But we who work at subsidized prices or, or who give stuff away, we can't rely on that to adequately measure and evaluate the success of, of what we're trying to accomplish. I think we owe it to ourselves and to our constituency and the credibility of our sector to say out loud regularly and up front what it is that we've set out to accomplish, to do it the best we can, and then to measure and report the extent or lack thereof of our success. The last dimension of accountability relates to what I said earlier about competitive, competitiveness and economic success. And it is the more or less free ride that we as the nonprofit sector get on taxes. Now, in the last two or three years, government budget surpluses have dampened interest in taxing nonprofits. But those of you who have been around for a while uh, remember that it wasn't very long ago that that was a hot issue and one that was getting hotter. And I promise they'll be back. Um, they'll be back sooner than we'd like to think they are. And I think we should consider now, as a sector, ways to address the growing perception of a seeming unfair tax advantage to nonprofits who are competing in many ways with for profit organizations. That we consider paying corporate taxes on operating surpluses when we have them as a responsible thing to do and as a way to blunt the recurrent pressure and possibility of, re of criticism and attack for having, for having a non-level playing field. It's easy to take for granted that by working for nonprofits and doing good things, we have a kind of a natural accountability, accountability to a higher order, so to speak, just like Hebrew National Hot Dogs in New York. But we don't. Accountability more than in the other sectors, in fact, is something we have to be explicit and vigilant about. And that brings me to the last, but by no means least, of the cultural challenges that I would like to talk about. A challenge that comes out of the word nonprofit itself. By definition, nonprofit is obviously a negative statement. We're defining ourselves by what we're not. And it's very hard to make a good impression by emphasizing only that we are not in the business of profits, especially in a society, whether we like it or not, where the word profit is not by itself a dirty word. Nonprofits cover, as we talked about, a huge range of activities that don't easily fit together. Churches, community groups, schools, foundations, advocacy groups, social affinity groups, whatever. Um, but the fact is that we need to do more work to define nonprofits in such a way that they are seen to be positive, constructive, contributing forces to the society, society re rather than simply uh, something that is defined by the tax code. In a limited sense, that's an issue of appearances and marketing. What we know from both government, that is to say politics, and private enterprise is that appearances and marketing determine much of the world that we live in. Appearance, that, that terrible phrase, perception is reality, has some validity to it. On that score alone, what we call ourselves as a sector is a non-trivial issue. But I think it's also a major issue of substance of seeing ourselves in a way that is positive, that is self-affirming, that is defining of the tasks that we are setting ourselves to do. I don't have a good definition, but I think places like the Hauser Center, where I know some work is going on on this, and where, with the support of foundations, they should continue to push hard at the intellectual task of creating definitions that aren't based solely on negative differentiation. For example, I think, and this is going to make my friend Mark here not very happy, but I think CTW belongs in a class of nonprofits that are very much like private companies, except that we are organized to achieve social rather than economic objectives. And for us, I think that the, the phrase that they invented on the other side of the river, social enterprise, isn't really bad. It's not perfect, but it's a start. We are an enterprise at CTW in the dictionary sense of a specific task and undertaking. And in the same sense that many businesses are private enterprises setting out to do something specific. But our mission is to use mass media to help children and families learn. And that's profoundly social and profoundly different from economic, 
from, from maximizing economic value to shareholders. It is true that individuals don't share in the profits that every once in a while we create at CTW, but that fact isn't why we're there, and it isn't why we're in business. And I think a definition that would help explain why we're in business would be very helpful. I think a lot of organizations could comfortably fit in a definition of social enterprise. Public television and radio, which I mentioned earlier, community lending agencies that are doing some incredible work in, in microloans and, and elsewhere, private educational institutions, the Nature Conservancy, that amazing, amazing organization that is doing such incredible work in between government and private enterprise. Those are, those are some examples. There are other classes. There are other needs for positive definitions, and I think we just need to get at that. Working in the nonprofit sector is more rewarding and more challenging than anything else that I could ever imagine doing or have ever done. And I think that those views are shared by most of us who work in this sector. Uh, it, is, it is both challenging, it is complex, it has all of the dimensions of what organizational life is about and the added dimension of doing something that you want to do to make some contribution to society. You just can't beat it as a place to work. And I think that accordingly, as we look ahead to the next century, we have to adapt and change as a culture and as a, as a sector to be able to be successful in what that, what that century is going to bring us. Cultural change is hard. I found that out in my own organization where we've been trying to change the culture for the last five or six years and we're making progress, but very slowly. But I do believe that if we in the nonprofit sector can change our own cultural outlook, the way we speak and feel and talk and think about ourselves, we can free ourselves up to step up to the needs and opportunities of the next century and to change, in fact, the expectations and perceptions of the society around us so that they will do a better job of supporting us in the work that we have chosen to do. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, I'm supposed to take questions from the floor. If you'd want to uh, either sit down or stand wherever That's you'd be fine. comfortable. Um, are there any questions? I have one. Um, <laughs> That's not fair. I understand. Uh, I guess uh, one, this question about, um, I mean, one way to think about what's interesting about social enterprise in the nonprofit sector and the way in which it distinguishes it from business is that uh, the nonprofit sector has a social mission as its objective and a financial requirement as a necessary means to the end. And in the private sector, it has a product market strategy as a way of achieving its ultimate end, which is to uh, make money, right? So, and I think, and then part of the cultural change that you were talking about, I assume, has to do with how to focus the attention of your organization on the financial requirement that it stay alive and get healthy and strong and even more powerful while not losing the mission uh, in terms of the ultimate effectiveness. No, I think, I think what, I'm, what I'm arguing for is finding a way that emphasizes, in fact, the social goal of the sector and what we're trying to do and de-emphasizes the lack of the financial piece. It's, it's really talking about, talking about what it is that we're trying to accomplish that, that evokes and makes people think about our mission and not simply think of us as those people who can't make a living. Inside the government or outside, or inside your organization or outside? Both. 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 Because I think that what happens often in the, on the nonprofit is that then inside the organization, people begin to think that making money is a bad thing and that having economic strength is a bad thing in and of itself. And outside the organization, people forget why you're there and only look at the fact that you're supposed to be nonprofit. So why aren't you poor? And why aren't you not, you know, why are you always, why do you always have your hand out and not able to do anything for yourselves and that you're not organized properly, blah, blah, blah. I mean, all of the business baloney that we've talked about. Okay. Let me, with your permission, if I could ask one follow-up question. This is turning out to be very important in some work uh, that, uh, that we've been doing. 
Um, at another point in the talk, you talked about uh, the importance of achieving, in the end, something you described as financial independence. Yes. And you could imagine that the way that you achieve financial independence is like Harvard, right? Having a sufficiently large endowment that uh, we don't really have to do anything. Uh, we're content to live on a smaller scale, right, for the indefinite future. That's, that's a good thing. That's one form of financial independence. Another form of financial independence would be uh, being able to earn all of your revenues from the sale of products and services on a commercial market without needing any charitable contributions of any kind, right? Which is the kind of independence that businesses go for, yes. right? And the third would be uh, a kind of financial independence that if you took the sum of all three of those sources of revenue, endowment plus products and sales plus uh, charitable contributions of a certain quantity, that for the foreseeable future, you could continue to carry out your mission. Now, the question that I notice in a lot of nonprofit organizations is that the pursuit of financial independence often causes them to not want to be dependent, to minimize the piece of their revenues that come from charity. All right? And that seems sensible because it looks like charity is an unreliable uh, source of money in some ways. But in some ways, if you aren't exposed to the challenge of holding your hand out to people and explaining to them what is the public purpose that you're accomplishing and why they ought to support you, it will be very tempting to have the mission of the organization shift all the way in the direction of maximizing revenues. And right. it's the exposure to the charitable requirement that keeps you focused on the public uh, service part of your mission. At least that would be my yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's. I think it is a difficult issue, and I do think that we have to. You have to look at the 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 overall mix of things. And I think that that what what I hear you saying is that one of the ways that a nonprofit can kind of ensure its accountability is by putting itself in the marketplace, to use that phrase, of people who are giving away philanthropic money because they won't give it to you if you're not doing a good thing. And I think that that's valid, and I think that's important. And when I say financial independence, I don't mean independently wealthy. I mean rather the ability to pursue your mission <clears throat> with a variety of income sources and income streams that can provide support for that mission. Um, because I think the opposite is also true, because I've seen it in our own organization and I've seen it in a lot of other nonprofit organizations, which is that the total dependence on philanthropic or the very strong dependence on philanthropic funds really pushes you in the direction of whatever the funder happens to be interested in. What, what my boss, Joan Cooney, used to say, say is one degree-itis, that you start here and, well, well now we're going to do a program about this and we'll do a program about this and, you know, 360 days down the path, you're marching in a completely different direction because that's where the money is. And a lot of nonprofits fall into that trap just as they fall into the trap of just chasing the, 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 the profit dollar, if you will. a couple of thoughts about that. I think, it's a, I think it's a problem for the organization that is in place, that has set its mission, and that is trying to find ways of getting funding to happen. Yeah, there are a diversity of, of funding sources out there, but if you, talk to, if you talk to folks who are, for the most part, totally dependent on grants, you will find them sort of saying, well, I can fit part of what I do into the 
category that that foundation or that government agency will support. And if I call my project this, you know, it'll, it'll qualify. And you get caught up in doing that. But there are, take an advocacy group. That's, right? A, that's right. Take an advocacy group where, uh, take my advocacy group, which I know better than I know yours. Um, it, I didn't want government funding because I didn't want those strings right. attached to what I did, particularly since I was trying to influence in some way government, which of course it adds that other problem which didn't come up at the panel this morning. But if you're really focused on lobbying, you're not going to get any foundation money because too high a percentage of your income will be devoted to lobbying. So that puts you in a different place than the rich tobacco interests that right. might be working on the other side of you. Um, and um, and the, I, I really didn't want to get into products because I don't want to sell videos. I'm in the business of talking about videos. I can't sell them or it's a conflict of interest. I didn't want corporate foundations to fund me because no matter how much I took off on, on McDonald's, say, as a, an advocate, if I took any of their money, I'd find myself on the front page of the New York Times with an enormous conflict of interest because the press wouldn't believe that I wouldn't have been more critical of McDonald's if I didn't have their money. So, so that left me very happy that there were a bunch of foundations and individuals. I mean, you can talk about individuals as slightly different from foundations. And that brings up the other thing that the national information, whatever it is, the place that rates how you are as a, as a poor slob with your hand up. Uh, what is that called? The, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, they, they give you A. Or, they look at they the. They once misread me, by the way. You, you have to do oversight over the kind of organizations that rate nonprofits. They once raided me, mixing me up with an organization in North Carolina, and they told all the people who contacted that very prestigious group that we didn't know what we were doing. And it took them three years to apologize, and God knows how much money I missed in the process. Um, you know, there's, there's accountability on all levels. But they forced me, and I don't think this was bad, that that kind of way of rating nonprofits, they forced me not just to have big grants from foundations, but to have some percentage of what I get come in small numbers, so that in a sense I had to raise a constituency of members, which is for a small underfunded organization, a real pain in the neck, she said, Desmond. <laughs> Probably more of a comment than a question, but um, I represent lots of different funding pots, but the one that pays my salary mostly is J.P. Morgan. Um, and the analogy that I use when I'm working with donors is thinking about, you know, operating support is equity investing. And I think that's where the dilemma falls into your comments, Mark, in the sense that on the, across the river, um, people who are investors in uh, for-profit companies um, make decisions in terms of which industries they want to invest in. But when they're buying a share of stock, they're not saying, I'm buying your emerging market business for J.P. Morgan, or I'm buying your private client business, or I'm buying this other piece of business. They're saying, we think the mission of this corporation makes sense. It's got a strategy that seems sound. Here's the money, and you, chairman of this corporation, spend it as you see fit. Most funders, and the philanthropic side, private foundations or corporate funders, for that matter, but certainly most private foundations don't invest. They are investors, right. but they don't invest that way. Um, they want to fund a particular pro piece of what you do. Um, or they want you to turn into Sorry. a pretzel to find the piece of what you do that might match what they're interested in. And so the balancing of where you get resources, it seems to me, um, is not as easy an analogy as we would maybe wish it would be in the sense yeah. of whether you generate revenues or whether you're, you know, have your hand out all the time or whether you're, you know, have an endowment. And frankly, even Harvard didn't get that endowment without having its hand out. Um, and as last I checked, still has its hand out all the time despite a $3 trillion <laughs> endowment. So, you know, no, you know. <laughs> Yeah, all the time, you know. I, like, so I guess I, I just think that it's important to think, I use the investment analogy with donors to think about a portfolio when they decide how to spend their money, but I think the same thing is true that we, there's no capacity for equity investing That's right. in the nonprofits in the way that would probably best make sense from your perspective yeah. as a recipient. I, mean, I, think that, I think that the article that was in the readings that, that Christine and, uh, about virtuous capital is, I mean, it is so on point because it is not only that the traditional philanthropic sources want to fund the fun part of it and not the unfun part of it. But it is that in, in accommodating to that, 
we tend as institutions and organizations to really keep ourselves weak as institutions because we, we have to go where the money is. So it is, it is not simply getting, as you point out, a diversity of, of sources of funds. It is finding a way of building your own strength such that you have some way of making the institution itself strong because otherwise um, you're not going to be here tomorrow to do what you're trying to do today. Can I just go after this metaphor, this analogy, because it's kind of an interesting point, I think. Just, we could view uh, the donors to nonprofit organizations as investors. The other way to think about them is that they're consumers, right? They're customers. They're buying something from the nonprofit organization, right? And you could imagine that what they're buying is the achievement of a social purpose that they're interested in uh, accomplishing. Or you could think of them as wanting to align themselves. Yeah, but I think that, I mean, I have some friends who are in, in, in different kinds of organizations that save the children and a couple of others. Sure. And, what the, and they're in the direct mail marketing business. They're raising money by mail. What they find is that the attitude of the, the giving public isn't about the mission and the support of the organization. It's just like the philanthropic sources. They want to know how many meals they're going to be fed and so and perfectly legitimate things to do. But, the, but what sells is not the institution and the mission. What sells is the delivery of the services. So the concrete evidence that the right. mission is being achieved, yeah. not the story about the, right. the mission is published. Um, but if that's true, then you could imagine that investors would come and buy, want to buy pieces of the mission and not others. And in fact, investors often now want to buy up firms and buy pieces of firms and say, why is it that I should have to take the firm's whole strategy? I want to have uh, you know, and they, and they often screw up the delivery of services because they don't get the infrastructure to deliver any of it. And that's, I think, literally what we're talking about. Hi, I'm John Lewis. Um, there's been a lot of attention paid in the last few years to, to educational achievement scores internationally and the fact that the United States students start off strong in the early years and then go downhill in the middle years and high school years, especially in math and science. And <clears throat> I think the Children's Television Workshop has done an incredible job of, of providing educational TV to, to young children. I just wondered if there's any efforts to try to recapture that middle school age population and high school age population in terms of providing educational television? Well, I, I certainly don't want to overstate the, the effect that we've had, but, but to, your, to the end of your question, as we look at the new technologies, we've just, we're just now in the process of making a major investment in online services, and that's more than I know about the technology, but I'll continue to talk about it for another minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we believe that that is going to be um, as, a, as a technology, it is going to be enormously powerful educationally, particularly for middle and older school kids. I think it already is being powerfully used that way, like television or any other technology, for how much for good and how much for not good is, is, uh, is very much a question. But I think that television um, probably as a, as a medium is going to be less useful with those older kids than it is with younger kids, and that's for two reasons. One is that overall teenagers watch less television than, than their younger siblings do. And secondly, to the extent that they do watch, really from about the age of 12, and I hope I'm not being just Pollyanna when I say 12, they're really, they're really watching adult entertainment programming rather than, than educational programming. And I'm not saying that it couldn't be done, but it's very, very hard to do it, and I think, frankly, the potential of interactive technologies is is much greater in that in that regard, and that's where we're going to put our our own investment in trying to get back into that age. Hi, my name is Megan Cole, and I'm a student at the Ed School. 
Um, I have a question, and I'm wondering if you could comment on CTW's recent deal with Nickelodeon to form the educational channel, uh, cable channel, Noggin, and how that business decision fits into your social mission mm -hmm. at CTW. Well, we have felt for some time, and we've been at this for, for some time, that with the pro proliferation, if I can say it, the proliferation of channels, what we've had is an explosion for the most part of entertainment, a lot of entertainment for kids, and that the overall amount of educational programming, alternatives and options that are there for children hasn't really expanded dramatically anywhere near to the extent that, that it has in the entertainment side. Um, so we have felt that really two things. One is that it's important to add to the core work that public television does that everybody gets uh, with, with another service. And in fact, we talked to public television about doing some of that together. And they're, I think, going to do their own thing because I think they feel the same way. The second thing that we think is that you know, it goes, you know, again, we get into the, into the technology. It gets into the, into the business of convergence, which is somewhere down the line, I hope, well past my lifetime because I don't want to learn all of that stuff. Um, but I think most of the smart people in the, in the media world believe that at some point the technologies of interactivity and television are going to come together, and they're going to come together in a digital universe. And that's really what our digital cable service is built on as a premise, that sometime down the road these things are going to come together and it's going to become a more powerful and very different medium, and that we want to be in there on the ground floor when we can still afford it. We found in Nickelodeon a business partner, interestingly enough, um, who for its own reasons had the same agenda. And I think partly it's, it's fairly clear cut. They have a very big franchise in entertainment television. If they think about adding to their size or their piece of the overall pot, just adding to the entertainment side doesn't really do anything except to some degree cannibalize the audience they have. So they, in fact, had been working on a point of view about an educational channel that is exactly parallel to ours. So, for, so it made a good fit. Whether either one of us is right about whether the thing is going to pay off economically, we'll find out 10 years from now. And it services um, younger preschool kids. Is that the no? It's 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 going to be it's going to make use initially of some of Sesame Street, but it's going to make use also very considerably of our library of older kids' educational programming. We're we're looking at we say two to 14. I think that's really two to 10, but. Uh, it will be both older and younger kids. Are there commercials? Are no. There gonna, no commercials? Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's why I never have to worry about mission. I know that Peggy's there on the other end of the phone. If I get off this far, hey, I don't, you know, she's going to be right there in my head. But, but I'm not saying that it shouldn't right. be commercials. Right. Um, that's a cable channel, and this is a business, and it's set up as a for-profit venture. You, I suppose that's positive if you say for profit, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and at some point, I would be willing to bet, and I am not a betting person, that when there are enough viewers, there will be commercials. And it's just that the hope is that these two companies, who, who have uh, both been, um, been productive for children and families, Nickelodeon too. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, Clues Clues is really a very nice program. Very educational um, and in their preschool block, Nickelodeon does not, at least does not interrupt those programs with commercials. That's right. And it's to be hoped that when, when, and I suppose if Noggin gets to be commercial, that Sesame Street will not be interrupted by commercials because the, the country would have a, um, a mass breakdown, I think, <laughs> to see commercials on Nickelodeon. Well, and, and, and we have, we have actually, I mean, we, we talked, we actually had an interesting debate internally between the two partners, which I, I don't think Herb Scannell will be at, mad at me for, um, for, for this revealing, which is that he was, he was basically of the opinion that, you know, it's never going to happen. That is to say, we won't ever get to advertising, so why don't we just simply flatly say it's never going to happen? And I, the nonprofit guy, was saying, well, you know, we can't see that far down the road. Um, I agree, we will certainly, we cannot ever interrupt programming for preschoolers, but if it comes to the point where to keep this thing going or to make it successful, 
we have to take advertising for older kids. I don't want to be the one who has to, you know, say, oh, just kidding. So let's not make that absolute statement. And it was it was a peculiar yeah, but argument. I, but I understand that. I don't yeah. want to sit here. And no, that's that. right. Um, I think, you know, that, that, that compromise isn't, uh, that compromise is a dirty word. I do not believe that compromise is a dirty word, which is how I got that children's television act to be coming. That's right. So far you've come out of the <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Marie Nelson. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I've recently been hired to go and work for an organization that does advocacy work for Africa. And uh, I definitely have witnessed in the organization a lot of the challenges that you've talked about today. And I guess as I'm leaving here to go there, my challenge is to understand how to become uh, a change agent within that organization. And I know that within the organization there's a lot of resistance to a lot of the, the things that you've talked about today. And I know um, that it's going to be really difficult having this Harvard stamp on me as I come into the organization <laughs> and say, you know, what are you doing? You know, you need to change and that sort of thing. And so I maybe wanted some advice from you in ways that CTW went through the whole changing of the organization's culture. And well, I think that if you just say that I just come from Harvard and I have all of the answers, that will probably do it. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's very difficult, and I, and I think it's, by the way, I should say that I, I'm not sure that what I've been talking about would fit very well within an advocacy group. I think that's a very special part of the woods, and, and Peggy can probably talk to that more effectively than I can. But I think that the, the, the understanding of the world around you, which many advocacy groups, that's why I think Peggy is such a model, is because she does use the dread word compromise. She really understands what the forces are that are at play in making something happen. And there are advocacy groups who would rather advocate than accomplish. I, so I think that the, there are needs. They may be different. And all I can tell you is what we have done in our own organization, which is to, A, keep at it and keep at it over the long term. B, and perhaps this is the, the, the most important thing that we've done, is to find ways of developing a crossover vocabulary. It's really, really amazing when you talk about mission, and I talk about mission to our nonprofit traditional folk, and they, you know, that's what they resonate to. I can say exactly the same content and call it business niche business plan. or business plan, and the other folks that we've been hiring in the last five years, they, they go, yeah, it's not that mission crap, it's a business plan. <laughs> And what you have to do, and, and I'm, only, I'm really not being facetious about this, you have to find ways of really getting them to hear the content rather than the words. Because I think on both sides of the river here, we get trapped in our own vocabulary and we get trapped in our own kind of tired view of what the other guys are doing. So I think that, you know, to go back to the advocacy point of view, it's the part of, your, of the work you're going to, it's, it's it, what, it is what Peggy did so enormously effective and continues to do so enormously effectively, and that is listening to the devil as well as to God. Because if you don't listen to the devil, um, he's more fun anyway. He's more fun anyway. <laughs> you don't know how to win the audience. So I, it's, it's, it's just something you have to keep I, at. I keep have at. an idea for the Hazard Center. You should put out a dictionary. Yeah. You know, you should have That's a good idea. That's a very good idea. A glossary. Yeah. Let's say, business nonprofit dictionary. Burlitz, yes. Because in every time that the definition of whatever it is we're talking about becomes an issue. And you could really make a difference with something like that. We're going to take one more question, but I'm tempted to make one further comment. Do you remember on Friday or last night, which must seem like years ago, Joe and I put up that matrix of all the different sectors? One of the things is, one way to think about that, uh, it was a sector, you guys missed it, but I'll explain to you later. Um, one way to think about it is that each of those represents a cell that we would have to prepare people for public leadership in, uh, right? All those different levels fall apart. But the other idea is that public action in the future will require people who can translate successfully from one of those cells in the matrix to another cell and be able to talk the language across the boundary the networks of capabilities that can actually put together both the resource mobilizing and productive capacity and pieces from all those different sectors to uh, solve social problems. 
dictionary it's a damn good so idea. that you can feel comfortable talking the language of business and not feeling it's very good idea. and uh, comfortable talking the language of nonprofit and government and not feel like you're giving uh, that you're cheating yourself that you're still speaking the truth but it's a different language that's being used might be a crucially important tool for those who would like to make change by knitting together these different sectors which i think is actually going to turn yeah, out to be the big challenge i think that's absolutely right sometimes i think that the degree to which i was successful is and this is not a, in, in this feminist world this is not a terrific thing to say out loud in cambridge but i think that it depended a lot on the fact that my husband bought a company public and i watched that happen and i heard at the dinner table all that vocabulary and once talked about um, the unfairness of the 30-second uh, uh, proposals, prospectus to children, uh, which is a commercial when for a prospectus to adults, That's right. a rich adult, the you SAC. have to sell, uh, you're <laughs> go public, you have to disclose five million different things, right. which makes it amazing anybody ever signs on to a public offering. But for kids, you can tell them anything you damn please uh, or nothing at all, and it's supposed to be a deal. You know, it's, it's fun to use those vocabularies that way. Sorting with the devil, Peggy is now recommending as well. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Wendy Feldman, and uh, my daughter, Claire, who's three and a half, adores Sesame Street. I don't mind watching with her either, I must say. But I'm, I'm very interested in uh, another part of your business, which is merchandising and marketing. Because I find it difficult to distinguish Sesame Street from Batman, Little Pony, Polly Pockets, all the other stuff that's available to kids in stores. I'm just wondering how dependent are you are, if you're not dependent on commercials, how dependent are your, uh, is your organization on marketing? We Selling are, to children, in other words. We are, we are extremely heavily dependent on the success of our product licensing, on the success of our magazine business, and, and on publishing online business, and on our international television business. About at this point, I would say, not counting public television support, about less than 5% of our support comes from traditional philanthropic s sources. So we are, we are absolutely out there. We are, what, what we try to do is to be as responsible as we can in terms of how those products um, are advertised, how those products are made in terms of what's, what, you know, what they are. But we're, yeah, we are right out there. We are, I mean, it is Batman on one side and Sesame Street on the other. And that's, uh, and it's going to continue to be that way and probably be more so. I want to defend me, me the, the character who moved in on program length commercials very loud and clear. That's right. When it was the commercial broadcasters in bed with manufacturers and the program was only on the air because it was a toy commercial. This is very different, and public broadcasting has uh, guidelines for the programs that they put on, and sometimes they're violated by individual stations, and then it would be very good if the individual audience yelled bloody murder. But the fact is that Sesame Street stuff um, has never been sold to children on, uh, on commercial television to children. Um, Joan Gans Cooney said at ACT's first conference in 1971, she said, selling to children is like shooting fish, fish in a barrel. barrel. That's right. And, and CTW has been very good about that. So that's how I position the difference. When you put it on as a TV commercial and as a TV program, the kids really don't know which is what. There's going to be a big need forever for parents to say no to plenty of merchandise. But I don't think that, that um, as long as it isn't the reason the program's on the air, which is a horrible problem, uh, then it's okay. I have to say one other thing on that on that score, which is that the guy who used to run our product licensing business, and he comes out of the world of product licensing, and in fact, he was a he was a, he's still alive. He just isn't with us anymore. But he was a wonderful salesman. He used to make a virtue out of the fact that we wouldn't let our licensees market the way other people. That we said, think of all of the marketing money you're going to save. Is what he, the way he sold them. <laughs> and <laughs> when we did the last. The last show that we did for public television called Ghostwriter, and you're probably too old to have been part of the audience for that. Ghostwriter was a, a show about reading, and we needed to use print on screen heavily. So we invented this character, Ghostwriter, who only appeared 
by what he wrote on a computer screen or pulled out of the air or off signs or what have you. So it was an, it, our lead character was invisible and mute. And when I explained to Bill Whaley, who is our product licensing guy, how we wanted him to go market and merchandise this character, <laughs> he looked at me in that wonderful way that business people do and said, I'll do my best. And then he just walked away. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, we're almost adjourned, but I have a couple of announcements to make, I guess. The uh, first thing I'd actually like to do is to add a feature to our program that I'm going to call the Brit Contest, all right? And the Brit Contest, uh, which is open this weekend, is for anybody in the audience to nominate a better descriptor of the nonprofit sector, all right? Um, and as uh, and we would like to entertain this, because this is a problem. I write this phrase a zillion times. Every time I write it, I hate it, and I think it's wrong. And I, so then I write words like independent and voluntary and third and all those other words. Uh, philanthropic, I mean, and they're all bad, all right? So I'd like to create a contest, all right, in which uh, we invite you to put your mind to the question of what would be a better way of characterizing this sector that would help uh, make it more transparent and obvious uh, why it's socially valuable, uh, et cetera. One of those bean, bean, Sesame Street bean products to the winner. Now, there you go. Now we've got a, all right, so. so we, I'm going to give you mine. <laughs> Okay, so that's an important thing uh, to do. Now, uh, another important thing is to uh, say that uh, refreshment is at hand, but it comes at the price of uh, doing some work on some issues that you've nominated as important issues. And I have the information about where particular subjects are going to be discussed. So I will read the topics and the location of these uh, things, and then you'll be able to get yourself to the room that is discussing the subject that you're interested in. Subject number one is what role do nonprofit organizations play in fostering political and social engagement? Right, so that's the role of uh, nonprofits in politics. It's Lit Tower Room 330, right up on the third floor, the Herzog Room. We have to say stuff like that because, you know, the donors' interest and stuff like that. Um, second subject is how does one build and sustain organizational capacity in the nonprofit sector? That's Lit Tower Room 382 the con room. Third subject is how should nonprofit performance be measured? That's in Lit Tower Room 380, the Watkins Room. Fourth subject, how do we define and communicate the value of the nonprofit sector to the general public and or to funders? Now that group, as far as I could tell, could spend all their time working on this subject, this contest that we just gave, right? And that's in the Belfer Building, Room 322 which is the third and a half floor, <laughs> right? And if you get lost, ask for the Malotus room, Maliotis room. Right, they are all donors, I assure you. Um, <laughs> the fifth subject is how can the capacity of nonprofits to create linkages across the public and for-profit sector be used to improve the community as a whole, something that was we were touching on uh, here today. And that's in Lit Tower room 332, the Deland room. And I'd like to thank you once again for your uh, close and attention and for your um, challenging uh, and awkward questions uh, and remind you that we start again tomorrow morning at 8.30. Uh, if those of you who are here this morning know that the tomorrow morning section is the least privileged one, the first one in the morning, because everybody gets you know, drunk tonight and then doesn't look quite available tomorrow. And I, just to show you the kind of leader I am, right, <laughs> I'm taking the least privileged sector tomorrow morning, and we're doing tri-sector partnerships for saving cities uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30 in the fifth floor of the Taubman Building. But thank you very much for your perseverance today. Thank you very much. <laughs>